the uh, next uh, table will be from uh, John Manis, uh, my co-chair here. And after this table, we'll take a very brief break. But uh, uh, John Manis' table here will be lessons learned about documentation and record keeping, which is extremely important when you're doing appraisal because things keep coming back to haunt you. Uh, John has been certified by the uh, American Institute of Minerals Appraisal for a number of years and is now uh, the president of CMC, specializing in, uh, in uh, particular construction materials, industrial minerals, and so on. So we're welcoming John here, who's also a geologist, to the podium. John? Uh, good morning. My name is John Manis. Uh, as mentioned, I'm with CMC in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, Tyler Portiero, my research associate, provided some assistance with this paper. Uh, interestingly, the, the paper itself, being that it's a lessons learned, is not a paper on how to document or to record keep. It actually discusses some lessons learned from an incident that happened at our company. Uh, I actually had unique perspective because I wasn't involved, but being an executive of the company, I was called in for the cleanup. So the lesson really is not necessarily about, as I said, not to how to make a work file, but something that's unique and appraisers should be aware of. So we'll start off with the, what if this happened to you? 9 a.m., appraisers getting ready to leave home, literally out the door with bags en route to the airport. Plan business trip to be away for the week. As he opens the door, two IRS special agents with suits and badges are waiting for him at the door. Let him know that they were performing a criminal investigation on a previous appraisal project. They would not reveal any information about the case. They want to discuss it immediately. They want to discuss the appraisal, the project, and the contract. And they provided him with the subpoena to appear in front of a grand jury in two months. True incident. The appraiser's reactions, besides wow, was A, he invited the agents into his house to discuss. He discussed the project, but keep in mind this was from memory as the project was four years past at the time of the discussion with the IRS. He did not recall the specifics of the contract, did not recall the specifics of payments. He did accept the subpoena notice, and I had to. Uh, he notified the other company executives after the agents left. He did make his flight, by the way, but he notified the agents on the way to his flight or sorry, other company executives, he did contact the corporate counsel the next day. Now, my perspective, as I said, was unique. This was not me. A lot of people say, this was not me. This was not me. <laughs> I was already out of town at the time of the incident. I heard the details of the visit secondhand from both the appraiser and the other executives of the company. I got to review the paperwork and all the documentation and details when I got back. And as an executive, I had to work with both our corporate attorney and a specialized IRS defense attorney. And I worked in the end with the IRS defense attorney for closure. Now, this presentation basically is in five parts. We'll have the discussion, the outcome, cost, very interesting exercise lessons learned, and then a little bit of time, hopefully, for questions. We'll start with part one, with the discussion. So the property where the mineral deposit that was appraised was located in Michigan. The appraiser is located in Arizona. The grand jury that he was subpoenaed for naturally is in Michigan. In 2006, an appraisal was performed for charitable contribution. The donation occurred in April. The appraisal, which was a retrospective appraisal, was performed later that year and in time for tax uh, records the following year. As is typical with many IRS, nothing happened the year after. 
nothing happened the year after. So two years had elapsed from the date that the appraisal was performed and submitted. Now we'll start getting into the outcome. 2009 was the first that we had heard from the IRS. And in June, the IRS conducted their review of the appraisal report. In July, they conducted some basic follow-up questions and answers. After that period was done in July, the appraisal report was satisfactory. Now we get to 2010, and things happen very quick. As a matter of fact, four months. January, February, March, April. So the first thing that happened in January, in the sort of the beginning of January, was when the IRS agents visited the appraiser. They had the interrogations. The subpoena was delivered. As I mentioned, the next day, corporate counsel was contacted. Corporate counsel's recommendation was to find and locate an IRS defense attorney because the appraiser was named to defend himself in front of the grand jury. And at that point, we had found and located an IRS defense attorney and contacted them. One month later in February, we had contracted the IRS defense attorney, and the, the de IRS defense attorney requested a lot of data and information. I will go over that next. We also conducted a meeting in Michigan with the defense attorney. In March, very interesting, a what's known as a queen for a day meeting which is a legal term for a proffer, and I'll describe that next. The original grand jury date was scheduled for the end of March, and it later got rescheduled to April. In April, the grand jury date got rescheduled. The appraiser was, did not go to the grand jury, but as a result of the Queen for a Day meeting, was found to be innocent, not involved. The grand jury got canceled, and at the end, the appraiser was now asked to testify in behalf of the IRS against the property owners. So fast-paced, more matter of four months, all of this flew. Also gives a precedence for cost to build up rather quickly and out of control. So the IRS defense attorney, what his role in the case was, was obviously sort out issues, interface with the United States attorney on the case, data collections and requests, response to the questions of the IRS, and arrange meetings and eventually the closure of this case. The data requested by the IRS def defense attorney was quite extensive. So first, he wanted the company and the appraiser's personal bank statements for the last four years. He required the appraiser's personal investment and pension records for the last four years. Appraiser's credit scores, the appraiser's travel itineraries for the past four years, copy of the appraisal, work file, project file, invoicing, and all notes and records related to the assignment. And as I mentioned, there was a queen for a day meeting. Now this is an interesting, it's known as a proffer in legal terms. It, it, by definition, it's an offer that's made prior to formal negotiation. So in this case, for the Queen for a Day meeting, the appraiser and the attorney met with the U.S. attorney at their office. They executed a legal agreement in advance. Anything said or provided during the meeting was completely off the record and inadmissible if the investigation continued. So really, it was a freebie, a discussion between the attorney, the appraiser, and counsel. All right, so... Now that I've kind of gone through that and mentioned it, we'll start with the first audience poll. Question one, anybody care to guess why was a criminal investigation conducted? Okay, but there was no issue with the appraisal. Any other guesses? Okay. Answer, the owners fraudulently obtained title to the property. That brings up very interesting question number two. Why was the appraiser investigated? Buddy? anyone correctly guesses the answer, then I own several beers. <laughs> okay, the real answer, 
November 2006, which was seven months after the donation and one month after the appraisal, the appraiser sold a used car for $12,000 cash. The IRS screened his personal banking accounts and presumed that the cash deposit was a kickback payment in return for helping the owners with title fraud and donation. So collusion is the answer. I owe you a couple beers, Tim. At the time of the initial investigation, now keep in mind, this was four years after the appraisal was done and four years after he sold his car, he had no, he ha did not recall the reason for the large cash deposit in, a, in the bank, and he also did not have any record of the vehicle sale from four years prior, cash sale. And here comes the interesting part, the cost. So what did it cost? It cost in labor and expenses, it cost in legal fee, and technically it cost lost revenue if you want to count what couldn't have been done while we were busy on this assignment. So starting off with cost, the first one kicked in is the labor. And so the office and the staff labor to research and provide documentation for the case. Mere cost of $2,461. Legal fees, cost of corporate counsel and IRS defense counsel, $11,600. Expenses, documents, travel expenses, meetings with counsel and U.S. attorney, $3,164. Those are technically hard costs. They were accrued roughly $17,000. Let's talk about soft cost. Yeah, revenue, lost revenue, lost opportunities, lost billable time, if you want to associate to that, delays and penalties from projects that got upset while this happened in four months, $32,140. So combined cost hit, so to speak, hard and soft cost, close on $50,000. Now, ironically, had the IRS showed up just 10 minutes later, they would have completely missed him. He was out the door to the airport. And again, why I say ironically is the agents would have had to turn around and fly back. Their, their announcement or their meeting was completely unannounced. And they flew in from the Midwest and the East Coast. So we'll throw the scales backwards here. But they would have had to turn around and fly back. Wasted expense. So now we'll go into the lessons learned. First one is just a prime matter of security and safety. I have a lot of relatives that are in the law enforcement, judicial, legal uh, fields. And so first to appraisers, do not automatically invite government agents into your home regardless if they have a gun badge ID. Any official or justice or judicial employee will understand if you ask for their name ID and badge number and then you call their local office from inside your house to verify that they're out on official business. Don't just take it that they hand you a business card and call the number because they may answer justice. They <laughs> say, yes, he's out there for me. Lesson two is attorney privilege. Contact your attorney immediately if you are ever under investigation, even before discussion with the agents. You know, chances are your attorney will likely be able to interfere and, or interface and minimize the questioning data and issues, plus reduce your cost and time spent on lost revenue. Client record indemnity. Now, this is an interesting one. The owners provided the appraiser with the deed and title record. The deed and title record checked out, and they were also filed locally where the property was with the, uh, with the county. So the standard title disclaimer that's include, that most appraisers put in their report, no responsibility assumed for legal or title, which was in the report, did not indemnify the appraiser in this case. The IRS believed collusion, found them guilty, before anything was discussed, came out and discussed the case. If you're an appraiser and you perform appraisals, especially for donation purposes or anything regarded to litigation, keep in mind that you could come under question any time for appraisals, for payments, for contracts, both on a personal and a business level. So definitely document any large personal cash transactions and maintain detailed personal and business financial records. 
first and foremost, I, I will ask, you know, I'm not here to beat up on the IRS, but the agents do come to these meetings. As a matter of fact, after last year's meeting in paper, I got new business and contacts from the IRS because they had some, uh, they had saw my presentation and had some questions and some follow-up. So I don't know if there are any agents here today, but if there are, we'd appreciate any advice to appraisers. Anybody here with the Revenue Service? Hey, records or title records from the deeds and records office. Isn't somebody else responsible for fraud in that? You would assume so. Like county appraiser? Or like county assessor? You would assume so. The other is the, the whistleblower statute. And sue the IRS. Get 10% of that cash back if you can prove that fraudulently cooperated. Not in personal opinion. We know state council. Thank you, Lewis. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Any other questions uh, in this particular case? I personally, of course, am astounded that uh, we live in a society where you are assumed to be guilty in this case here before there really is anything for it. I guess the grand jury would have been the key thing, wouldn't it? So would you also add the recommendation that uh, rush to the grand jury as soon as possible? Yes. But in your case, it didn't happen, and why was it it didn't happen? Uh, basically, with the Queen for a Day meeting, everything got po the grand jury. The appraiser, I hate to say, was acquitted because he was never really guilty of anything. But the whole case was dismissed, and they decided that the appraiser was involved. Okay, and would you would you ad address please into the microphone? Thanks. What would be the statute of limitations for this? Well, interestingly, what I found out from the corporate counsel is that everyone loves to use the phrase statute of limitations, but statutes of limitations don't exist. But what does exist is that everybody may have a report. You may have done a report years ago. The damage and what sets all the legal action is from the date of discovery. So you may have done a report in 2002. All of a sudden, the owner... This was very common right after the recession. The owner came in and said, oh, everything's bad on this property. Everything's gone afoul. That is their date of discovery. So even though the appraisal was done in 2002, it does not, it's not exempt from a statute of limitations. It's exempt two years from the date that the discovery or the damage or the conflict. And I'm curious on the cash amount, if there had been I, I don't know. I don't know if there's a specific trigger that sets the amount. Being a large cash, the timing was bad in that. Pretty much right at the same year that the appraisal was done, immediately after. Completely on the case. Thanks, John. I have another question. I think most of us in here realize that when uh, John Manis, in his presentation, talked about IRS attorney. He did not mean an attorney working for the IRS, but rather an IRS against the IRS experienced attorney. Is that correct? That is correct. Our legal counsel had recommended us to an attorney that specializes solely in IRS cases and defense for, well, it doesn't have to be an appraisal. That was basically. Okay, fine. So I'm 
sure most of us understood that. The other thing I had, which is more an Essex question, uh, John, could you tell us how it was possible without having a conflict of interest, how you, after having worked for one client in such short time after, could then work against that client in a matter of law? Yes, the, according to the IRS, John, they don't care about the ethics. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> actually, it, it was interesting because the appraiser was asked to testify, but he never did get permission to do it. I did bring up the ethics at the time that he was asked, and they had asked him to go forward, but he never actually got any permission. Well, so what is the answer? Is there an ethics violation if you work for a client and then shortly thereafter you are called into a, uh, an obvious uh, legal case where then you are asked by the party attacking your client to testify from them? Do we have any comment from the audience? Lewis? One comment with regards to the state. Long time ago. Shannon Pratt, Chicago. Parties in state policy. Appraisal appeal. Judge ruled that it was reasonable. Okay, I wish in a way that uh, uh, Dave Abbott was in the audience, you know, the AIPG guru on uh, Essex matters. Uh, I think if I were to to read into this myself, there would be an apparent code violation because there is in our code of ethics, there is indeed uh, the uh, code that says that you have to be loyal to your client. But I think Lewis may be aiming us the right way and saying that if it is a matter that involves the public well-being, such as a criminal case against the party, then that may be overriding the particular uh, part of the, the ethics code. In any case, we have a couple of comments. Bob Frame, you had your hand up. Would you speak into the mic? We'll get you next. Uh, I'm only speculating here, but it would seem to me that if you take the doctrine appraisal Fraser independence, literally, that confidentiality would not be an issue. If somebody brings you an appraisal assignment and you take it on, you could just as easily have taken on uh, the opponent. Fine. Not be in violation of anything other than that. Obviously, you couldn't do them both at the same time. Again, I'm just speculating. Okay, I think that's a, a good comment. You have a comment to that, John Manis? One item that did come up, as mentioned, is during discussion with the legal counsel, I did bring up the appraisal quote enemy. And uh, it was brought up that on the basis that there could be ethical issues and that would be invested. We would discuss that later. We never got to that. But he did mention that in the case of the subpoena, jury. He had to appear. And the questions they asked him, he can say on the stand that that's confidential, that's part of my client, et cetera, but the judge would likely give him a order to off the stand, et cetera, to basically gather that information. Okay, we had another question. Please go to the mic. No, no, please go to the mic. Right there goes 10 steps. One, two, 
3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Five, I would eight, think that would be a constitutional violation. Your name, violation. please, for the record. What was your name? Steve Olmo. Steve, what is your comment? I would think that would be a constitutional violation. Possibly um, dealing with the federal Thanks, Steve. Uh, to get Bob Frame's comment back, I think uh, if it's a matter of testifying to the existence of the prior report and to the content of the report, whether confidential or not, but saying, yes, this is my document, I made that appraisal finish, then I think, well, you're an independent person, you did an independent appraisal, and now you just testify that that is your report, period. Now, if additional questions are asked, well, do you think, is it your opinion, Mr. Manis or whoever that was, that uh, this is such and such and such? Now you're getting into additional things, and that's where I think, Steve, you would take the fifth, so to speak, I cannot say under my ethics code. Okay, I think that was a very good uh, thought provoking table. It means keep records, you know, and uh, with that in mind, let us, uh, we are we're pretty much on time, a few minutes late, but let us take about three minutes to stretch a little bit, and we'll start again here at about 10.20. <laughs>